Okay, we should be back. Yes, we are. All right, great. So, um, so Chris, I wanted to, uh, I wanted, we were just talking about the art supplies and things. I wanted to, to transition and talk about your imaginary places collection for a moment, if you can. And um, then I want to ask you a bit more about your story and what's coming next and things like that. But, okay, um, before you do that, let me show yeah. you something here. Okay, let me show you a painting. This was the first painting, oil painting, that I did in 30 years after the Waterhouse exhibition. This is a copy of John William Waterhouse's Windflowers. This is, it's not finished completely yet, but it, it's good enough. I want to show it to you. Yeah, go for it. Oh, goodness. I'm trying to zoom in here on the resolution. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow, okay. I can see, I, it looks quite shiny. You've got gloss and layers in there and things, like the treatments, whatever. Yeah, it's, it, it's got a coat of temporary varnish on it to protect okay. it. But that was my first, basically my first oil painting in like 30 years and was the first time I ever painted a human being. Right. Which I, which until recently I had problems with, but I worked through that. Okay. It, drawing human faces and bodies is not the easiest thing in the world. You really need to sit down and practice the technique to do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there, there's a method called the O'Reilly method, which I highly recommend to learn on how to set up a human face or body. Once you know how to do it, it's not that difficult. I still have, I, it's like I'm not a portrait painter. I couldn't paint a portrait of Carl, mm. but I can do people now. And then again, part of it was, part of it was, was, was seeing that exhibition and being inspired by it. It mm. really inspired me like nothing else I, I can possibly explain. Mm. So, so do you see yourself, it, it looks like one of your primary mediums has been, um, did a lot of watercolors, you did some sketching, drawing, and then you do some oil painting or have done some where you see. I actually doing prefer doing oil painting, but right now, okay, you said I have a huge collection. Really, I need a much huger collection. Um, there's the art part of the art business, and then there's the business part of the art business, like anything else. To really get your foot into this, I think you really need to have at least 150 paintings to start with. So that way you have 30 that are good enough to show people. Okay. So right now I've got about 85 watercolors, maybe 90, some of which are in progress, some of which are, most of which are finished. And I've got about 35 or 40 oil paintings, which all of which need some work. Okay. The problem with oil painting is I love the results. I love the way it looks. I strongly prefer it to acrylic, but it takes time for it to dry. It's slow. Mm -hmm. Mm. There's ways okay. you can speed it up, but it, 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 it does take time. It's not like watercolor, you know, I, I, I can go through a watercolor and I can lay down a coat of something, a, a wash or something, and it's dry in 45 minutes. And then mm. I can do something over it. Oil color, it's a day. Mm. Even, with, even with the mediums that make it dry faster, it's still 24 hours before I can go back and work on the painting. Okay. And I'm not really a wet on wet painter. One of these people like Bob Ross, he's a wet on wet painter. He does the whole thing in 30 minutes and it's done. Which, yeah, by yeah. the way, I love Bob Ross. It's not that I love his art so much. It's okay. It's not bad. But I love his attitude about bringing art to the masses and anybody can do this. Yeah. I, I absolutely love that guy. And one thing you probably don't know he is play his shows are on endless rerun here in Germany in English. They play him every night at twelve thirty or one AM. They've been playing him here for forty years and everybody wow. loves the guy. And he has made art a major hobby in this country because mm. everybody watches his shows. Awesome. Yeah, I, I grew up watching Bob Ross. My mom used to do some painting. I tried my hand at it, but I didn't stick with it long <laughs> Well, it's like anything else. One of the things they taught us in architecture school was being an artist has nothing to do with inspiration. Being an artist is no different than being an engineer. You learn the skills, you learn the procedures, you learn how to do it, and then you do production. And you need to think about it as a nine to five job where you go to work 40 or 50 hours a week and you produce. And if you do that consistently, 
you'll get good. Mm. It's true. You will. <laughs> Anything that you do 40 or 50 hours a week for decades, you'll be good at. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, well, it shows. So, so let me come back to my other question, Ed, if I may. Thank you yeah, for that yeah. fascinating segue. So um, in, the, in your Imaginary Places collection, now obviously I want to come back to the, I want to, I want to start, I want to know more about the, my side of the mountain painting because on the face of it, it looks like a realistic landscape. However, it's in the Imaginary Places collection, so there must be a story behind it. Yeah, um, that was something I painted in, um, I think, November, December of 2018. And it was just practice landscape painting. And the inspiration for that was a book called My Side of the Mountain that I read when I was eight or nine years old. And there was a story about a kid in New Hampshire or Maine or Vermont or something who decided he was going to take a year off from life. And he moved into a tree in the forest, you know, about, it, he wasn't completely gone. I mean, he was like 10 miles from his house or five miles from his house. And he could go home and get a meal. True story. He really did this. Oh, okay. And so this kid went out and lived in the wilderness through a winter in New Hampshire, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, brutal. It's minus 30 in the wintertime. But he learned how to survive at nine years old out in the wilderness. And so that's, that was something that was inspired by, by reading that story when I was a little kid. Then it came back 40 years later. Right. Well, more than 40, 45. Well, there's a, there's a North American U.S. kind of influence there. And then, um, and then I also I have to ask about the castle because I'm a, I'm a huge, I'm a fan of castles. I'm sure living in Germany now. It has some of the most famous castles in the world, but uh, this the castle on the river. What can you tell us about that painting in the Imaginary Places collection? That was just something. That was just something that I did. I, I've got a whole bunch of those things that I've been working on. as sort of another series of castles here, there, and someplace else. And those those are usually really fast. I didn't really have a big story behind that one. I was thinking, you know, this is a castle that a young woman lives in and she goes out and she plays in the meadow or something like that. But that's really as far as that story got developed. Okay. Cool. So um, I want to come back, if I may, to the I'm going to test my German pronunciation. I lived in the country for two years, but <laughs> don't test me. The, the, the Fachwerk Hauser collection, that one. I'm going to come back to that. Fachwerk Hauser. Okay, that was that. Fachwerk Hauser. So the, um, the number 10 one there was, was that. So those are the, the timber frame houses. Mm -hmm. And um, there's number, the, the number 10 one there has, a, is a, it has a, the, the building and has a yellow door and thing. I know you mentioned that you're, you're, it's a whole collection and it's a bit, uh, the stories are a bit different, but. There's something that does that does painting those uh, houses take you back to your architecture roots or you obviously have an appreciation yeah. for that style. Yeah, it does take me back to my architecture roots. I, I always liked that style of house. I actually lived in a half timber house in Massachusetts that was built 200 years ago. Um, you couldn't tell it from the outside because the outside they had redone the, the covering on the you know, on the outside of it, but inside you could see the beams and the ceiling and stuff. Um, yeah, it takes me back to architecture school and I can do some whimsical things, you know, like put a doghouse in and his tail's hanging out of the doghouse or something, or there's cat eyes looking out a window, or most of those paintings have a few lights on in the house. The question is what's going on in the rooms with the lights on. Um, that yellow door is actually sort of derivative of the hobbits. Okay, yeah, I think it was almost circular or something too, right? Yeah, exactly. That was the idea. Okay, you caught it. Okay, that was the modif. That's where it's coming from. I do those things are, are reasonably quick. They don't take very long to make. Again, the idea was was to sell those locally to tourists who wanted something to remember Bavaria by. Yeah. Okay. Where actually they started up in, in uh, not did they start? They started here. They started here in Bavaria is where I started doing that. Um, I'm not sure. I just... I've got three more new ones of those that I like a lot more than the first 12 that I'm going to be posting here shortly. Okay. Um, 
I have a feeling that that whole series is going to go in another direction with a lot more storytelling. It just hasn't gotten there yet. Sometimes you've got to work with something for a while before you see its potential. Right. Like I had a like I, I did the second flower painting, which is not yet up on my site. It's on Instagram and it's on my personal uh, Facebook art page. And that one looks really cool. It kind of looks like this plant that can eat human beings or something. Right. So I think that's going to turn into a series of like surrealistic science fiction plants or something. But when I started that, I just sort of had a very vague idea. Okay, and I painted the first one of those here in Bavaria in a hotel room I was living in for a month when I first came here to start my life in Bavaria from leaving Hanover. Mm. So we could, I'm just looking at um, how we are. So we, we probably, we can carry on with part three here for another few minutes if you want. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned Bavaria. I know you've been living there for a little while now. You want to tell us a bit more about how does that how conducive is that the region where you live now to your creative process and just oh, how do you about living there? Huge, enormous. It's like this is the land of of, of fairy tale castles. It, it's it's everything you know that you think of Germany. It's not Germany. It's Bavaria. It's much more like Austria or Switzerland. It has almost no connection with northern Germany real Germany, where I lived for, for 12, 12 and a half, 13 years. Uh -huh. um, the lighting here is absolutely stunning in the daytime. It, mm -hmm. There are some places in the world, like, like George O'Keefe in New Mexico, Holland has just stunning light. The light in Holland at certain times of the day is just unbelievable, okay? You just look at it and it's like, God, I can see why people here paint. My God, you have no choice. You know, it's like, who needs LSD here, man? You just walk out of the house and it's like an LSD trip. Mm. Um, Bavaria has that. Bavaria has that kind of light. Okay. It's high up. The altitude here where I live in Kloster Lechfeld is 1,500 feet, 500 meters. If you go down in the mountains, it's a lot higher. That's only 10 miles south of here, and you're in the Alps. Mm. Um, the light here is amazing. A lot of the architecture from hundreds of years ago has survived here. It wasn't bombed out by World War II. Mm. Um, it's amazing, artistically. I mean, there's other aspects of it that can be a little weird sometimes, but <laughs> it, it's very different than Hanover. It's like a whole different planet here. And you knew yeah. Hanover, you lived there. That's Prussia, okay? That's Germany. This mm. is Bavaria. Bavaria is not Germany. It's Bavaria. That's why it's called the Free State of Bavaria. And they take that very, very seriously. It's like they have their own country within a country here. It's Catholic. It's not Protestant. Mm. Um, you know... There's a dark side of this place from World War II, and you can feel it, you know. It, it, you know, I live eight miles, or not eight miles, eight kilometers north of Kaufring. Kaufring had at least 11, maybe 12 concentration camps and more people than Dachau and Buchenwald put together. Mm. Okay. It's where Victor, Victor Frankl, this is where he, he was in Dachau for three days, then they sent him to Kaufring, the book that he wrote, it's written here, eight mm. kilometers from where I live. Mm. Okay. Um, if you saw a band of brothers yeah. like, fight, yeah. the, where they go into the concentration camp, that's 12 kilometers south of here. Mm. Okay. You're right dead center in the land where this all happened. So, yeah, it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. Most of the people here are really cool. And there's some Bavarian rednecks that'll scare the living jibbejesus out of you, okay? I mean, it's, you know, it's Bavaria, man. It's, it, 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 it's not London, man. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I lived in Hanover for about two years. One year with the MBA where we studied together, and then the second year. And then I visited, um, we visited Munich for Oktoberfest, as you do. And it had a very different feel, even just going down and coming back. It was like another world. It was sunnier down there. It just felt, it was one difference. And the, the dialect was different as well, even to my ear. Oh, my um, God. I, I have problems understanding these people. 
And they can all tell, oh, he's American, but they can also tell, oh, he learned German in Hanover. Right away, they know you learned German in Hanover. You did not learn it here. You're Hanoverian. Yeah. They know that in 10 seconds of a conversation because of the way I pronounce words. Hmm. So, so I, um, so Chris, we're probably, we can, we could, we could talk about the other artworks for, for a longer amount of time as well, I'm sure. I, we could pause, we're coming up to the, the, probably the, the natural sec, uh, end for se section, session three. Um, happy to come back for a session four where we talk a bit more about. All right, let's do, do, are you having fun with this? Do you want to yeah, do yeah. another one more session? All right, then let's yeah. do one more session and then we'll try to wrap it up for tonight, I think. Sure. And we can watch this worldwide Mick Jagger and Keith Richards play guitar at home thing that's going on on the BBC. Yes. Um, which we do get here. We do get BBC broadcast. Thank God the war is over. Thank God all of that stuff is behind us. I'm really glad we live in the modern world, not in the old one, okay? And I would like to say, you know, I, I had cancer here last year, and I was treated here in a German hospital in Augsburg, actually two hospitals, and the guys who treated me are world-class cancer specialist. I mean, absolutely top of the game, as good as the Mayo Clinic in America. They are absolutely top. And those guys, they literally brought me back to life. Mm. And I'm really thankful for that. And, and you know, it, it's a weird feeling because it's like I'm one of their big success stories. And with neck cancer, when you have a tumor in your neck, most of the time it kills people mm. in a year. And it ain't pretty either. So I sort of feel like I have a responsibility here to actually do more with my life than just go on and, you know, go to work and come home and drink a couple of beers. It's like, yeah, now I really got to produce this artwork and I really got to deliver something because there's a whole medical staff of 25 or 30 doctors and 40 nurses that got me through chemo and radiation therapy and two major surgeries. So, you know. So, so um, we can delve into that, uh, and I'd like, if you're comfortable, we can delve into yeah, sure. that next seg segment, and then we can round up and cover anything else. Yeah, the question is not if I'm comfortable with it. I'll tell you the truth about anything. The question is if you and the listeners are comfortable with it. That's yeah. your problem, not mine. I, yeah, so from my perspective, as, as your friend, I, um, you've got so many stories of high highs and tremendous, you know, tremendous highs and, and depths of lows. You've experienced everything, you know. You, you've had a much more varied life than many people have had. And, yeah. uh, and I, I, it's fascinating for me. And I just, uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to give people a window into that world. So we'll, we'll pause here. We'll come back for part four and then we'll pick it up from there. All right. Sounds good. Great. Thanks. Chris. Right. Yeah, man.